staff member and also a member of the Center for Integrated Nanotechnologies. He has always been working in very interesting fields. He worked in strongly correlated system. He worked with magnetic superconductors. And today he will tell us about a new field, the direct materials. So, Sasha. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Anders, for good introduction, nice introduction. Uh, I'll be talking about the, uh, I'm not sure if it's a new field, it's a suggestion to look in a new, in a new way at the set of seemingly diverse materials. And what I would like to offer is a framework uh, within which these kind of like commonalities observed across these classes of materials can be put into the soil, the certify category. So, it's not even a new field, it's just a suggestion. So it's a problem about something where you look across the different disciplines or different classes of materials and see some, some common ground or common kind of phenomenon. Uh, this talk in some form and shape I will put at some point on this website so you can take it off from there, download. And uh, yeah, subtitle of this uh, discussion will be similarities and differences between different superconductors and graphene. Uh, but the idea is that uh, the set of materials is much wider than just two given conductivity graphene. So as we go forward, I will outline what kind of materials we discuss. <coughs> I would like to acknowledge the important and stimulating so like, uh, work or discussion of these colleagues and advisors, Grisha Volovic, Volodymyr going all the way back to the London Institute, Anders Rosengren. Uh, I've been fortunate to have very good postdocs who are working with us at Los Alamos, Arjun Albano, Jan Zinju, Martin Salkola. And my interest in graphene uh, started after visiting, or uh, during the visit, to the uh, uh, Wiesendagner group, uh, where I came across a very good uh, student, uh, Tim Bevin, and with whom, with whom we started collaborating on some questions about the graphene. And then I realized that, again, uh, there is a common ground between different classes of materials or kinds of materials. And that's how the idea, the genesis of this idea about the Iraq materials came, came about. Uh, so I will start with the Dirac equation. Because my main thesis would be that the Dirac equation is insufficient and incomplete and in a sense misleading way of thinking about this material. But uh, this is put it so like in the in, in extreme. But, uh, so perhaps a more adequate way of viewing it is to say that the main thesis of this discussion would be that the uh, uh, notion of Dirac fermions in some materials is important and interesting, but it's uh, by far kind of like, uh, just the beginning of, the, of this road to understand the behavior of these materials. So my main thesis would be in a way that uh, I would be emphasizing the life of these Dirac fermions in real materials. And so just like real proper materials property reflect the existence of the Dirac fermions in those. By the same token, materials or material properties affecting the properties of the Dirac fermions. The material issues affecting the properties of Dirac fermions. Okay? So, uh, Dirac uh, wrote this uh, article about the quantum theory of electron in 1988, and very quickly after that, he got a Nobel Prize. And as far as I can tell, this was the early days of quantum mechanics. And the important thing was that this set of equations had a predictive power in terms of uh, predicting particles and antiparticles that were observed subsequently, subsequently in the experiments. Uh, but for our discussion, uh, what really matters, I guess, is that uh, the Psi, this Schrodinger equation that describes the time evolution of the wave function Psi, uh, the Psi itself is a multi-component wave function. In other words, at a given time, at a given point, there is many components that describe different beasts living so and interacting with each other. And so what I mean specifically as we go for so like for the case of a DOA superconductivity or graphene would be that uh, there are particles and there are holes. Namely there are this like, very interesting linear admixture of particles and holes forming quasi particles and superconductors. Where the multi-component wave function comes about in graphene because you have two sub -lattices. So those are not the Positrons and electron component of the wave function initially talked about in, in the context of the vacuum, but those are the effective sort of components we're forming in the, in the, in the material. And uh, 
What Dirac was able to show is that uh, existence or this equation is uh, adequately capturing the spin one half nature of the electron, the, the G factor. They are very interesting related to the Dirac nature of this equation, uh, related to phenomena such as Klein paradox and Sitter relating. And of course, we all know in condensed matter that the uh, in order to address uh, adequately or properly spin orbit coupling and real materials, you have to start with the relativistic version of quantum mechanics. In some sense, this is the right equation. So, uh, not that we're going to use them heavily, but uh, okay, let me start with a snapshot here. This is uh, the, the bubble chamber snapshot of the photon coming in and producing. Uh, electron poison here, they get opposite charges, so they curl off in opposite way in the magnetic field. Uh, and so this exactly this uh, evolution, if you want, in time of one component, another component of the wave function or in the right equation. So uh, if I were to do the particle antiparticle symmetry, if I were to do so like the particle to antiparticle transformation, it would mean that I have to transform different components of the wave function and so a generator for this transformation would be some whole diagonal matrix that mixes up or permutes the components of the spinner here but in the case of again of the graphene or a given superconductor it would be something that converts particles into holes in the Fermi C or in the Fermi liquid or it would convert this like uh, wave function sitting leading on predominantly one sublattice into the wave function leading on the other sublattice in the so there is this parallel language actually that allows us to map what happens in the conventional sort of relativistic quantum electrodynamics or discussion in the context of Dirac equation what happens in real materials. But this is by far probably, not by far, but this is a, probably the least interesting part or property or issue with this novel class of materials to be discovered or as we go forward are discovered now around us. Okay, so even though I started motivating this thing, saying that it's a Dirac equation, essentially I would like to point out that questions about properties of the Dirac materials are not the questions about the properties of the Dirac equation. <coughs> and so let me guide you through the logic here. Uh, so how do I define Dirac materials? As we go forward again, basically we see the similarities between different classes of materials. And I'm beginning to, so I think about this, maybe not only me, but I'm sure that other people notice it as well, that uh, the, the set of facts discovered in one context in condensed matter dealing with these uh, relativistic or quasi-relativistic terminals, namely uh, Dirac sort of terminals, is rediscovered in another subfield without people really talking and uh, talking to each other. So I think it's a time now to maybe kind of suggest, it's a time to suggest that there is a new category of material so what are they? Those are the materials where the non-trivial electronic properties are direct, a, a direct consequence of Dirac's spectrum. And by Dirac's spectrum, I mean that uh, there's a vanishing sort of set of points of uh, lower measure. It could be point or it could be line on the Fermi surface, where the lowest part of the spectrum is controlled by excitations around these points or lines. So this could be Dirac lines if you want. To, but, uh, uh, so here is my sketch of what I mean by that. That actually, if I have some uh, dispersion of effective excitations near the ground state that's uh, living only inside the sub particle point and having linear dispersion, I would call it the rough point and there are line nodes. So, those excitations living obviously with a shrinking phase space, controlling extreme low temperature properties of these materials, and uh, um, they are responsible for, for instance, unusual power law dependencies the penetration depth, specific heat, and other responses of the superconductors in a very different fashion from what we expect from the conventional superconductor. People sometimes call this excitation the nodal terminal, but they also have this kind of direct like spectrum, energy, linear and momentum. Essentially, it's like an extreme case of the Fermi surface, available phase space for excitations at lowest energy shrinks to zero. So it's not exactly a gap, but it's not exactly uh, standard sort of metallic situation. Uh, so how do I design materials? Because I tell you about the classes, so at least I have to give you some examples. 
one way to design a material like this would be uh, to create collective state which has non-trivial gap structure, which has non-trivial sort of excitation spectrum. And examples are, a uh, certain example close to my heart is the helium-3, superfluid phases of helium-3, at least eight phases, and other phases might have like lines or points of load, and the gap in the vicinity of these points, you have this uh, very rapidly shrinking phase space for excitations. Another way to design it, or basically people do talk about the unconventional superconductivity in heavy fermions or in high temperature superconductors. There are did it some, some density waves that we have no. So essentially what happens is that regardless of what the reference state is, if you generate a set so like collective state on top of it and assist a low energy description of this collective state, you can reduce it to effective description in terms of this uh, Dirac thermos or Dirac excitations. So this is one way to de design these materials. And we have probably about six, seven uh, different kinds. If you look at the subclasses or subcategories, you might more than that. But then, uh, alternative way to do it would be to uh, rely on the uh, some interesting band structure effects, such as the example of graphene, where for some reason, actually, uh, this directization, if you want, the formation of the direct points occurs spontaneously in the band structure. And I don't know, maybe there are some three theorems about why and when it could happen. I don't quite know the, the topology of it. I'm sure that there is a very powerful topology underneath of it. What exactly are demands on the best structure uh, to generate the Dirac points? But graphene is the one living example where the band structure, the pure case, in the ideal situation, would provide this Dirac, Dirac excitations. And so you can see that actually we not only have this collective state, but also intrinsically that there the, the could be a state materials where these direct points can occur, direct terminals. And so at low energies, it doesn't matter where it's coming from, you're looking for some universality of this description. And so I'd like to focus on the material properties of this, uh, of this uh, material. Sorry for the authority. But I'd like to focus on the, if you want, move away from the direct equation. I would like to sort of focus on the really how this interplay and the very interesting physics of how this direct excitations interface with the real matter. <coughs> and again, just to repeat it, it's not about direct equation anymore. And so I know that actually the discussion about graphene and other materials is always coached in, the, in this uh, language of uh, direct thermos, and it's very interesting. But I think, frankly, we are sort of somewhat past it. It's time to look a little bit deeper, the second level, third. So, uh, what are the common features of this material? Well, we, I would like to sort of say that there are some very interesting features at the nanoscale, and I would sort of spend some time talking about the purity and homogeneity in high temperature superconductors, and the purity and homogeneity in graphene. Why? Well, because basically it allows me to showcase, to showcase what I want to say. And second, because the classes of material, number of those is already like more than five or ten, it will take a longer time for me to cover all of this. So rather than hopping from one to another, I will just put them side by side and we will cross compare this material. Okay? Uh, another thing, uh, another point I would like to select. Uh, impress or argue for is that uh, the playbook with these kind of excitations is well established. We are coming off from a very established and uh, very developed field of high temperature superconductivity, where in particular local scale probes are giving a lot of surprises about the properties of this material. So I would like to argue that actually the playbook will follow up, will be followed up by in, in, the, in the context of graphene. The, the, essentially, we know what will happen next. And typically, sort of the logic is that first we have some average description about the effects of the homogeneity and disorder. We have some effective field theoretical description, and then very rapidly we will converge on the need to address properties of these materials at another scale. Now, in itself, uh, I don't have any reason to, to argue for that, and I'll show you the data first. Okay, but the corollary to this is that actually uh, it's very important to have the adequate tools both theoretically and experimentally, to address this 
this uh, what I'm what I call nanoscale homogeneity. As we go forward, it has it's become more and more evident that it's actually coming and get generated and reproduced and the growing class materials as well. So not only direct fermions, but these nanoscale questions will come up in a more and more powerful fashion. So uh, the playbook is that, like I said, people do talk about the universal electronic thermal transport, and then very quickly we'll go to local effects, scan probes. Now why? Uh, another way to argue for that is that uh, we are at the stage now where, for instance, if you look at the functionality of devices made out of these novel electronic materials, is controlled at the nanoscale. You know, if you look at the Intel chip that's sitting in your computer, very soon they will get to a level where very few dopamine atoms in a transistor control functionality of this transistor. So I would say that just from the practical point of view, to describe the properties of these materials on average is uh, not very interesting, not the most pressing uh, you know, way to, to discover this material. So sort of like um, it will come again, but my, my point on that would be that uh, people do talk about statistics very a lot. And so one of the statistics is the average seller. Now, it's of course very nice to talk about, about average salary, but most of the people first and foremost care about the, their own salary, or specific salary. And so the same, you can go and talk about many different things, basically different examples of this. The description on average is only, can, can only get you that far, but really uh, one has to be able to address, uh, address these materials at a very local scale. So, like I said, I will narrow it down to diversification activity and graphene. Uh, and like I said, please keep in mind that it's a broader classes out there. So, to set the stage about high temperature superconductor, what we're looking at is uh, electronic properties of this very complicated uh, compound. And it has bismuth, it has strontium, copper. This is high temperature superconductor, bismuth 2212. Uh, we believe that the most important piece to focus as far as superconductivity and unconventional superconductivity of these materials is uh, this uh, copper oxide layer uh, and they made out of D-wave orbitals of copper and P-wave orbitals of oxygen so they form the square layers and those are the, 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 the kind of electronically the most important or some of us believe the most important so it's part, of the, part of the game about unconventional superconductivity what is graphene? Graphene, well, there are many ways to talk about it, but suppose you have a nanotube. I presume you've heard quite a bit of talks about nanotubes. So suppose you have scissors, you cut it and unroll the graphene nanotube and get a shade, one sheet of carbon atoms. And those are hexagonal lattice atoms, I mean hexagonal lattice single layer uh, structures, and I will talk about this more later. So, but in both cases, essentially, we're focusing on some extremely widely two-dimensional, or really two-dimensional objects. And the coordination structure uh, could be different, it could be square lattice, it could be <coughs> triangle lattice. Uh, so there are some similarities and differences. So how uh, this terminization or directization comes about in the DIY superconductor is very simple. If I have a Fermi surface, which I try to draw here in a circle, and I come in and open the collective gap or superconducting gap, which has a node in this four point. So, for instance, if the gap vanishes as a function of momentum at the four points on the Fermi surface of dx equal to dy, then the, uh, at the Fermi point along the diagonal directions, I have essentially very few quasi particles. And those quasi particles are responsible, or they face space for this excitation, they're responsible for kind of filling up the gap and this V shaped characteristic view of timing density of states in the case of the superconductor, all right? Uh, and like I said, these nodal points are responsible for all sorts of anomalies and cosmic physics in high TC at low temperature. Uh, so I need to explain to you how STM works. And why? Because I already made a thesis that I, it's very important for me to follow up on the electronic properties of nanoscale. 
So what is the STM? The STM is a scanning time in microscopy, microscopy or spectroscopy. And what it is in the nutshell is a very sophisticated profilometer. Okay, STM works in a way where you have a sharp needle sitting in the vacuum and it's trying to tunnel into the substrate of insert. Uh, the typical so like, uh, setup is the needle is, has well characterized and presumably dull and trivial density of states. And you buy the tip with respect to the surface. And you have a fraction of the states that can spill over and tunnel an equilibrium and you don't have a bias. You have a essentially equal chemical potential in the tip and the substrate and there is no current flowing. And when you bias the tip with respect to the substrate, there is a certain fraction of states that can tunnel and produce a tunneling current. Now, what you can do, imagine that you not only sort of like tunnel around, but you can um, drag this keeper across the sample. And you can train your electronics in keeping in the steady state in the steady or constant time. Time. So when I drag around, if I encounter some object sitting on the surface, because the object is coming closer to the keep, and the car and the timing probability is exponential in distance between the keep and the surface, in order to maintain the current steady, basically keep retracts. So that's what how this uh, topography of the sample surface has come about, and that's how people so it get generated this very nice. Uh, um, interesting, so like atom atomically resolved images of the surfaces. And if you throw the color in it and all that, you send it to nature or science and you get a very good publication out of it. So this is actually a standard game, and that's how and why the, the scanning probe uh, technique was invented. To essentially look at the surface uh, properties, predominant structures. What's more interesting for me is the ability to uh, locally interrogate the electronic structure. How exactly, essentially measure locally the atomic density of states or atomic conductors. So instead of looking at the sort of constant currents of that, imagine that I come with a tip, part of it here, and I know that the current is proportional to convolutional density of states between the tip and the substrate, so derivative will be sort of a proportion to the local density of states of the substrate assuming that one of the factors in this uh, proportionality is the density of states will keep itself as well. So what I can do then, I can locally image, or not image, but measure electronic properties. And so the beauty or very interesting uh, uh, aspect of STM measurement is that it's a dual probe, essentially in one shot. You can image how the structurally the surfaces look like how electronic it will work. And so this is a constant interplay between those two. You can cross-correlate the, say, structural defect or structural aspects of the surface with the local electronics or the properties. And there is a very interesting physics going on there, so, but I'm not going to talk about this. So, because it's colloquium, let me tell you a story about this STM. Uh, you probably heard it. So Binning and Rohrer invented it very recently. And uh, the story was that uh, Alex Muller, who was head of the lab, or head of the department, I don't know, at IBM Zurich, uh, he was uh, thinking about start working on KDC on metal oxide. So being as a new poser coming to, to IBM, he said, you want to work with me on this? And Binning said, no, no, I have my own idea. So he refused to, so like, politely after, I'm sure, but you know, he kind of decided to go on his own and pursue his own ideas. And of course, pretty soon after that, they built this STM, and eventually got a Nobel Prize for that. The first publication was done back in 1982. Uh, the story about this is that, uh, actually there are two stories. One of them is that uh, Alex Muller, when they were having an idea of building this kind of atomically resolved tunneling device with no precedent, in fact, uh, they didn't have money and they couldn't convince the managers that I began to give them funding. And so Alex Muller was across the corridor. He was like a very prominent scientist in the IBM lab. They came to him and he gave them uh, a month. And uh, I think it's like 50,000 Swiss francs. It's a, it's a substantial, I would say, but, but in, by any measure, it's not prohibitive amount. And uh, so they took the money, they, they ran with it, and they built the machine, and it's working. And I. 
I did verify the story with Alex. So Alex has some, some other colorful details about all of it, but basically he was uh, the, the, the remarkable fact for me in the whole story that when he gave this funding, you know, funds for them to build it, he didn't send benefits personally. You know, he wasn't planning to be a part of the co-author on this paper. He wasn't even in his department. But he felt that this is important scientific inquiry. And so he felt compelled basically to give them this fund. And I'm really impressed by this because to me, the, one of the sort of, uh, important measures of the magnitude of the person is this, uh, exactly this kind of actions where you steps, where you do it without really, you know, you do it for the institution, or you do it for the community, you do it for, kind of for the society. You're not standing to benefit directly. And another sort of story maybe for, for more for the students here is that uh, I'm also impressed with Billy coming into the lab and saying no to Alex and saying I have my own idea. And so for, for the young people in the audience is that I think uh, sure you have to balance uh, things uh, older or more wiser colleagues are telling you against actually the things you're excited about. It's okay to pursue your own ideas if you're excited about them even though you might go for a while against the flow. All right, so why, why bother with this STM? Do we have a case? So this, uh, this is our belief. That's how the business looks like uh, in theory or in textbook, especially if you went through the textbook about the band structure, where, of course, we start with translation is very advanced. That's how it looks like. Uh, you park your key, you measure, that's how it looks like in the data. All right? So my point number one would be that we do have a strong case for nanoscale electronic and homogeneity of these materials once you have a right set of glasses. Uh, I would say probably even stronger thing that I should. The amount of ignorance of power about the behavior of matter at nanoscale is stunning. And the part of the reason is that actually we don't have a just start scratching the surface about what's really going down there. Okay, so a lot of these uh, things are built into myth-like structures because they're essentially beliefs. So, but uh, if you go back and actually start from questioning very basic assumptions step by step, we will be more surprised. So I'll show you also surprises in graphene. Okay? So let's go here for, for step by step. So this is actually the tiny conductance of the field of view of the bismuth oxide superconductor, and at the same time, this red bar tells you exactly at what voltage you measure it. So you park it, say, at this side, you measure the IDV, you move a little bit, you may measure it here, 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 here. And that's how you acquire this map. But you acquire this map at a fixed voltage. So this uh, complicated multi dimensional uh, phase space where you're walking through. Then, This is actually very different from what the conventional iodium dicetonide superconductor looks like, right there. And uh, if movie runs, I'll show you that this is true for all energy scales. So this is a nanoscale homogeneity electronically persists all the way to reasonably high energy, to 150 millivolts and higher. In this material. So, uh, and this was a pretty big surprise for the community about five years ago. Now, what do you do? Well, there are a couple of ways to deal with it. One of them is say that actually this is all surface effect. Because it's true, it's tunneling on the surface, it's all surface effect, there is nothing in the bulk. I mean, the bulk is perfect. Now, of course, if we only stay on the surface, if my world is actually a two-dimensional world all the time, it's very hard for me to, so like, to see what's happening in, in, the, in the third dimension underneath. And so it remains a big question. I'm of opinion, however, that actually this does represent to some extent what's happening in the bulk. Right, but that, uh, talk about beliefs. This is my, well, it's belief rooted in some of the data and some kind of like, some tangential evidence. But it would take us off way, way, so, way, way far. So, to be so intellectually honest about it, yes, we, can, we don't have an airtight proof that this is what's happening in the bulk, but certainly this is exactly the surfaces people do use in other probes, for instance, in angular result for the emission. And publish the papers about discussing the properties of superconductors. So we're not doing anything different in looking at this electronically as compared to optically. No, for right. So, 
So next step, I just showed you about nanoscale homogeneity and ability to sort of see this and be sensitive to it only if you have the right set of tools. So I'd like to sort of start from the opposite side. Suppose you have a nearly perfect crystal and you have very few defects. And I can address what the role of these defects is. Uh, and this brings us to impurity states and the D-wave superconductors and the pin. And then I will talk about electronic nanoscale homogeneity in the pin. And again, to repeat. Uh, what, what's happening right now is in the context of graphene definitely is a rediscovery of the same set of questions, the same set of probes, the same set of kind of learning curve uh, as people go talk about the electronic properties of graphene. Uh, and of course there are very interesting so like, uh, issues to address subsequently or more, for instance, the role of correlations, topological excitations, berry phases, cryptic crystals. This is more in the, in the the context of the graphene material. So, um, back a while ago, uh, people looked at the role of the defects in the superconductor, namely, basically, to put impurities in. Now, we know impurities are bad for superconductivity. Why would you want to do that? Well, one, thing, one way, basically, I argued for that is that uh, if you take any conventional microelectronics or uh, um, um, uh, semiconductor, functionality of these semiconductors is based on the control way of producing impurity effects, impurity bands. Without impurity bands, semiconductors are boring and trivial. Uh, another one in the case of the superconductivity is that you, you deliberately destroy superconductivity locally. And the idea was that uh, uh, by how it crumbles down, how it gets destroyed, you can see what the order parameter is, what the superconductivity state is, superconducting state is. So you deliberately destroy it, and by the way, how it Get destroyed. Maybe we can get some ideas about the nature of superconducting states. So, a couple of things which were immediately so I, uh, observed namely, that uh, electronically you will have to impure the resonances inside. And of course, it always plays if you have a sharp contact. So, if you have a low density of states to begin with and you have a sharp resonance, uh, you see the sharp, so like uh, bright features in the tunnel you see. And another one is that one can connect the intensity. In an SPM, it was a scene in the uh, religious for particle for a pairing state. And maybe one can see if it's a device of can that or not. And they were observed. This is actually the resonance seen on the impurity side, specifically the zinc side, and the distance to what it is. So this is not exactly this nanoscale homogeneity. This is deliberately placed, assuming things are under control, deliberately placed defects. Those are the impurity side. Those little cross shaped states. That's how they look like if you zoom in. And you can see that there is no average, so like gray scale here, no average behavior. There are very local electronic defects that are essentially sitting at nanoscale in this, in this compound. And for a while it's been pretty exciting, so like development in the field because it offers the alternative spectroscopy of superconducting. And so data from Cornell Group, Shannon Davis made it all the way to the cover of physics today. Now, of course, these are real data. What, what, what happens is when you have color, things are really just like, uh, look nice. Um, uh, so let's talk about the electronic properties of graphene. And again, I will tell you that there is a repetition of what the Clay book tells us or how it happens in the DOS superconductor. And for that matter, for any so like to be discovered, Dirac so like material. And uh, the proposal is to image local electronic defects, dopamine. Coming back, that's uh, to remind you, graphene is essentially unrolled carbon nanotube with a single sheet of the carbon in the hexagonal lattice. It's a long mist allotropic form of graphene, uh, of, gra of carbon. So graphite is essentially a stack of graphene sheets in some fashion. And that's why the graphite is used in pencils. These this, uh, sheets slide off very easily, and that's why you know, the sheets prefer to stick to the ferric paper rather than to the graphite itself when they write. And that's, you know, we use them every day. Then, uh, back then, the, 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 what I mean back then, going all the way back to probably multi-wall so configuration of 
carbon nanotubes, which is essentially one-dimensional configuration of carbon. Started from 1952 to discovered in 1991. There, is, there was this uh, zero-dimensional buckyball and uh, graphene configuration, uh, long presumed not to be stabilized and not to exist in the nature in the free state was realized in experiments by uh, some of the slides I borrowed from or used uh, from Andre Gay. So Andre Gay, Philip Kim, essentially this game group that pioneered this technique in which they were able to so, like, generate these uh, flakes of a single layer of graphene on the substrate. So uh, electronically for us to describe this uh, direct thermal need to introduce some transport, popping of electrons on the flakes. So the common way to deal with it is uh, to introduce nearest neighbor popping with a very large popping overlap with about three electron volts and then the near, near next nearest neighbor popping which is much smaller. So if I put electron here essentially the only place of hope to large extent would be with the sequential Uh, the structurally, this uh, crystallized look very nice. And that's what prompted the whole discussion about this beautiful so like, direct terminal in this material. So this is a plate. You can see it looks pretty, pretty homogeneous. It's about micron long plate. And the angles you see there are consistent with what you'd expect in a hexagonal way for armchair and zigzag edges. And you don't see any homogeneity here. And structurally, it's very nice. Um, and I will tell you about electronic, so like what happened electronically in this material in a second. But uh, to build this band structure description, uh, what we observe immediately is a bilayer, or so I guess a bipartite lattice with the, uh, with the uh, two sub lattices, red and green, or red and yellow. Uh, and uh, um, so the hopping, nearest neighbor hopping, would be so like in the some type binding approximation, some off diagonal cross. So I have two components for two sub lattices. So any wave function in the electronic wave function of this lattice would be two component wave function. And that brings the spinorial nature of computation. And we can call it a spin or pseudo spin. Um, and so the, the, the uh, it turns out that there is a nodal point. In the vicinity of a nodal point, you can linear, linearize spectrum. And you will have uh, direct like structure. Kinetic energy for the hopping of the terminals in this lattice would have a linear term uh, rather than start quadratic. So P squared starts linearly. But because P momentum or hopping matrix element is inherently complex, uh, what you will have is a linear term of P but have a complex part. So it brings in these two different types of the Pauli matrices to keep track of the real and Write it down as a sigma of p, where sigma is two by two by two power m. And uh, I apologize. This is I know it's a colloquium, but I'd rather not to talk about the two by two power matrix in greater detail. So <coughs> suffice to say that actually we have a two-component wave function, and we have some matrix, and this matrix is a component. Now, in principle, there is no mystery in the. Uh, hexagonal two-dimensional lattice. You can put in Mathematica and diagonalize this uh, problem and we'll get some distortion. And so distortion is shown here. Uh, in some choice of a brilliant zone, you will see that the edges of the brilliant zones you have exactly this uh, cone touching each other. It's also a direct terminal excitations leading this cone to the brilliant zone. And the velocity that describes this distortion very steep. Remember the nearest neighbor popping term is actually three electron volts. So the three electron volts from the kinetic energy for taking the electron from one side to another. So this very large velocity and very large kinetic energy ultimately is the reason for stability of graphene. This material sustains putting contacts and it shows the room temperature point of all effect. And so I'll, I'm sure maybe there are some other reasons, but to me one of the underlying reasons for that is that uh, uh, kinetic energy is so high that essentially it doesn't like to be distorted into anything else. It prefers to <coughs> uh, 
uh, density of states in this polynomial phase <coughs> space for excitation is very similar to Hilbert's conductor and the graph point. <coughs> now, if you, what one can do now is uh, uh, essentially feel produce a field effect, on this, not field effect on this material by doing the device <coughs> back in and changing the feeling factor. And so, let me call this point direct point. Then you can play by properly biasing the back gate here. So this is plate. Suppose you have some electronic contacts actually coming to this plate. You can bias it so the same kind of potential will be below Dirac point, at the Dirac point, and above Dirac point. As you can clearly see, as you're sweeping this bias, uh, you're hitting some maximum in the resistivity, which is sort of consistent with very so like very conducting, very few electrons or very few carriers available. Uh, transport in the field. So this is sort of like a measure of your point, how narrow this peak is. People do make quite a bit of issue about the exact value of its conductivity. Uh, and I think it's a very interesting question. But uh, very often the language or discussion is misguided, in my opinion. Again, for the reasons I will show I will show you, but I already showed this in the case of the US there are some very local nanoscale effects happening. And for description of the behavior of this material, a Q equals zero for a detective lifetime description. Uh, might be true, might be not. I don't know how it maps out on the real, on the real like electronics and graphene. So, because of very high velocity, and this being direct fermion, it controls this slope, this V fermion controls the Landau level splitting when I on the very field. And if you turn on the field of about 10 Tesla, the Landau level splitting is about 1,000 Kelvin, which enables a duration of the quantum hole effect at room temperature. So you apply the same 10 Tesla as you apply, but you don't need to go to milli Kelvin temperature range because the level spacing is so high that you're effectively already in the ultra low temperature range. And what really um, quenched any doubts about the direct nature of this material is this uh, simultaneous observation of the quantum pole effect in graphene by uh, Manchester group and by a group of Philip Kim in Columbia. And I would say that actually talking to Andre again, he was saying that this paper was sitting in the, uh, they were fighting the victories for about a year before the second group comes in and measures it because Victor was saying it's just impossible. So the temper, the, what I'm showing here is that they have 4 Kelvin, but they all subsequently were showing that uh, you can have the quantization, one out quantization of temperature. So it's only after the second group comes in that they, uh, they accept that they, this is the real result, the physical result. Now, um, I'd like to take this uh, a little bit further say that actually my, my interest and I think technological and electronics interest if we were to build any any devices in this on these materials would be to look at the nanoscale and so the like I said proposal is to look at the dopants in detail. Do we have any background or any information about this? Uh, a little bit both in graphene and a little bit in graphite but people didn't look at it to the extent to which they should probably or they will. So uh, uh, the, the, the data I'd like to sorry, point out is this uh, data taken by the Tokyo University group where they looked at the uh, tunneling, STM tunneling on the surface of the HOPG where they found this uh, few defects that looked like a bright spot. What they were really focusing on is the field evolution of the Wanda levels. So they were looking, tracing these peaks in the functional magnetic field and seeing how it stands out. Uh, but even the zero field, there is a peak, and I think actually this is exactly the, the central gap states one can produce and one sees in the Hilbert city conductor. So for that matter, uh, um, yeah, there's a paper that's happening that was published very recently in December last year. No, December of 2006. Uh, so all of this set of questions about local imaging, local electronic properties are just now coming in in the discussion of this uh, material. I would point out just a basic fact 
relationship, uh, the existence of this intra-gap or kind of low energy resonance for impurity states and the consequence of suppressed density of states, the consequence of derived density of states, it doesn't rely on any particular nature of the state. It can happen in superconductor or it can happen in the, in the graphene, it can happen in, in, in other materials as well. And so, um, for instance, just to illustrate, one, one can consider the heat configuration where I put in one heat pad to the surface of graphite or the, in the graphene, and then yeah, on this deep pad side itself, intense heat or like low energy, so like tunneling probability, tunneling probability low energy will be very low. And the first sites locally where the, there will be large intense heat, low energy, very low energy compared to bandwidth, uh, would be near site. It's very interesting, so extending through that way, that encodes as what sublattice equation in the deep pack. Uh, so look, if I put the deep pack here on this red circle, red impurity side, on the sublattice A, A is dark, B will be bright, A is dark, B is bright, A is dark, B is bright. So there is a standing through that ripple uh, that encodes essentially at what sublattice equation is deep pack. And it would be very interesting to image it. So I would say that group level is a three three fold targetization is similar to what's seen experimentally, but more studies need to be done. Now, Andrea was always saying that graphene is a perfect system for electronics. And I, I totally agree, this is amazing material. But as we sort of dial up our kind of understanding of it, that's where uh, things coming up to be more complicated than we thought. So again, one of the surprising discoveries during the last year was a nanoscale of homogeneity in graphene. So let me show you. So you can see that it's, a, it's true that it's a direct fermion, but there are some really serious material issues that color our understanding and what the physics of the, of the direct fermions in the particular material. Uh, so this is the data. I'm taking a snapshot of the data taken by a here from Harvard where they measure the local charge distribution. The scale here is about like half a micron. And what he was imaging was the charge in the surface of graphene in a single flake of graphene. So uh, I don't have this uh, image to contrast it for the structural image where it looks like this flake. Remember the flake where I was showing you the uh, zigzag edge and the armchair edge, how nice and homogeneous it looks. But that's what how it looks like in the now, as opposed to high temperature superconductors, probably the reason here is benign, is that uh, this flake is sitting on top of the surface, on the surface of silicon oxide. And it has a lot of sort of charge in homogeneity in silicon oxide because of dopant, because of defects in silicon. So what you see probably here is the paddles of the charges that I sort of accumulate in certain regions just to screen out the effects of the uh, Coulomb impurity. Here's another so a set of data from the Joe Strosia group. And again, yeah, it's a science paper published recently in, in, in published in 2007. So this is a topography image of the team. Again, in particular bias, and the larger the, the smaller the bias is the more of a range of color. <coughs> so basically, what color encodes here is the uh, spatial variation of the tonic conductance from the and again, you see nanoscale of homogeneity in this material. So you can see by the naked eye, there is something like here and here at this two sides. Very likely there are some defects sitting there that's causing this, uh, this distortion. So where it's coming from, at this point, is just anybody's guess. So it could be purely intrinsic physics dealing with the Coulomb interactions in the presence of Dirac like fermion. Another one it could be substrate. Uh, another one pointed out and pioneered essentially by Misha Katznelson and uh, his collaborator Andre Game, etc. was this observation that graphene being st structurally so stable uh, when it deposited on a substrate, the substrate is not atomically flat, it will have a step-like edges mm -hmm. or it have some protrusions. And so it's like a mount to the putting in the silk, silk scarf, say, on, on this desk or on this table here. And so the, 
the, the, the graphene sheet itself will not be flat in real space, but will look like a very ripple. Okay, and so there is a lot of discussion about maybe gauge fields approach to Dirac terminal to describe the behavior of this ripple, which is a very interesting way to do it. You know, there are many ways to, to address it, but uh, clearly, if there is any structure to, char to charge or to electronic stopping in these ripples and this graphene sheet, it will produce some um, modulations as well. But to what extent, uh, I think I would say it's fair. To what extent is not clear at the moment how operational, how relevant this, this, uh, this idea is. It needs to be investigated as well. So I think we're narrowing, we're coming to conclusion. Yeah, so here is a amplified point about electron hole paddles. Once you have the right set of glasses, probably the fact that it's a direct terminal is not even the most important one. I mean, it might play into so like the properties of it, but really what's, what's important is it's like a lot of nanoscale homogeneity in this material. And uh, yeah, this is actually just to show you, this is a variation of about 7, 10 to, to 7 to 10 per square centimeter charge variations well, for the average charge uh, measured in this particular experiment by Jacobi was about 10 to 11. So 70% of the net charge modulation. So let me conclude. I would like to conclude with the huge direction of pointing out some inadequacies in the current approach. And I would say that there are some strong similarities in the Dirac material across Dirac material. Though this is the idea of Dirac terminals, but interfacing or re realization of living in the strongly correlated material matter, and where the low dimensionality strong correlations can strongly affect or are very important in the properties of this excitation. So we do have a growing list of materials with similar properties, and I gave the list uh, early on. Those are the anti natural superconductors, any anti natural states, the nodal excitations in the thermionic spectrum, but also graphene. Um, I would say that there should be very interesting new physics emerging at nanoscale, and this physics has no precedent in nicely behaving bulk materials, which implies that for us to be so like faithful to the physics of these materials, one has to have the right set of tools. So that's why I spend so much time talking about nanoscale and homogeneity and scanning uh, probes. One thing is actually the right, right set of tools, experimentally scan probes, but also the right set of tools theoretically. If I set up my discussion about this with the so like translation invariant block theorem basis, it will take me a long time to get to this so like to really capture. I mean, the choice of basis is a choice of data as well. You know, we all know do the unit of transformation, it's up to us what, what basis to choose. But in practice, it's always pays to start in the right place, at the right place. If not for nothing else, just for economy of description. So I would say that it calls out for this uh, very interesting uh, next step in our analysis of the properties of the physics in this, uh, in this, in this matter, in direct matter, I guess, is that uh, one always has to be able to one call, th th this observation calls for the ability to constantly switching between the real space and case space. So we can no longer can be so like just talking about effective Q equals zero, effective Q field. Well, um, I guess that's it. Thank you for your attention. One of your transparencies, you remind about supersymmetry. You skipped this transparency. Could you, could you come back to this transparency and explain where supersymmetry is here? I wasn't talking about supersymmetry. Yes, but it was written on your transparency, which you skipped. Uh, no? Uh, at, 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 at the beginning. Yeah, okay. Of the there? It was some relation between energy and uh, K. Yeah, so there is a parity, there is a chiral. Mm -hmm. and there before, is, before the chiral. Chiral? Before. Before the transparency. Uh, okay. uh, 
a little bit later. Should be yeah, late, no, uh, later. Look, uh, if if there is a supersymmetry there, yeah. uh, it's not what I wanted to discuss. But uh, I want to discuss the particle and the particle symmetry, which in the case of the Dirac in the in the vacuum would be so like. The, no, no, but you understand that the shortest way to uh, uh, discuss supersymmetry it is uh, usage of Dirac equation because Dirac uh, sigma p generator is one of the generators of supersymmetry. And if you are talking in terms of fermion, you're talking about non relativistic version. You're talking about non relativistic version. Yes, it is non relativistic version. Yeah, zero mode and all that. Fine. Uh, yeah, no, I wasn't talking about this. This is actually. Uh, sure. This is actually, if, if you can, so I come up with a nice discussion of supersymmetry in the context of zero terminals, terrific. I, I think I know what you're talking about, but I wasn't addressing it. Okay, I'm sorry. So I want to dodge the question, but I, you know, we can, it will take us off on the tangent. Well, it was also clear. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm curious, you had a list of references on bumping up the relation of crafting and the application and I'm curious since you had the other paper on seminar in the library, but if you had the earlier reference, 56 or something, can you comment on that? Uh, I don't remember 56. There was a paper by Wallace in 1948. Yes. You know the Wallace? No. Oh, Wallace did the, 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 uh, the, the this is a, he actually died last year, I think. Uh, so, but in 1948, he published a PRP where he did the band structure essentially of graphite. Mm -hmm. With this gamma one, gamma two, oh. whatever the, the, the nomenclature is, gamma, 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 gamma prime, gamma double prime, etc. But as I, so I build up for that. He showed the band structure for graphene. Mm -hmm. And he showed that uh, you look at the tight binding Hamiltonian, and you can see this uh, Dirac force, linear spectrum at the, at the corners of the brilliant zone. You know, hexagonal lattice in real space are places hexagonal lattice of the, in, the, in the reciprocal space. And he was showing that the spectrum vanishes there. Mm -hmm. So, um, and uh, it was an interesting observation, but again, it was very interesting theory. Nobody kind of latched on it because there was no real material that would support this kind of bad structure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm glad. Glad. Do you know if people are trying to deposit graphene films or is it still plates? Are people trying to make films? Yeah, okay, yeah. So that's the danger. We start talking about materials and then people come to you with all sorts of materials questions. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm theorist, in case if you don't know this. I'm not doing this, but what I know about how people do this is that uh, uh, you can do the flakes, or you can do this uh, the here method, where he does this basically silicon carbide with a lot of solid carbon in it, and then he heats up, and essentially, because of high mobility of carbon, it comes to the surface and forms kind of irregular sheets. Uh, this is a less reproducible way I don't want to so like, pass any judgment on experimental techniques, so please don't. I have to apologize, especially if I'm um, on the record. But uh, <laughs> what I'm saying is that this is a way to produce a larger sample, but of a less uh, reproducible quality. So for instance, this kind of larger flakes are very important if we want to do artists, where the spot size for you to, to do the uh, angular result for the emission and measure the spot emission of the material we require to have a big flake, big size kind of so, uh, <coughs> yeah, the, so if the question was about is there any other technique than, uh, than the, 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 uh, the scotch tape peel off, yes. It's, uh, another reason, I guess, why this material is catching on like, uh, like a fire and dry sort of brush is that it's all tabletop experiments and everybody can do it. Not everybody, but basically a reason, after reasonable effort you can do it. And so you can have, in the same institution, you can have somebody who can Growing samples, uh, this thing sustains place in context uh, at room temperature, so you can do a lot of electronics, it's like measurements, with relatively low cost. And so it's just wonderful material, no matter how you say it, I mean, how you look at it. So the, 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 the thrust of my discussion, again, is uh, these are direct terminals. If you want to have direct terminals, fine, these are direct terminals, but these are direct terminals in real world material, not in the vacuum. 
So sure, we can talk about all sorts of anomalies uh, of the QED type, but it's a, it's a old news for the field theory crowd. We don't have to like condensed matter community I, I, for condensed matter part of this audience. We don't have to pretend that we do we do doing this. There, there are wonderful issues in the in the in the materials physics. And I think actually the very exciting thing is that actually you can bring the new players and combine them together with the direct terminal. For instance, inelastic or coupling of the direct terminals with the lattice, with the phone, with some collective modes of some other field. It offers us a testing ground that's not easily available for like another material. So direct, you can show that the graphene bilayer offers the possibility to have a mass, mass, fully mass chiral terminal. That's another sort of very interesting sort of system to look at. So looking at the effects of disorder, looking at how it couples to real matter fields and all that, it's not bad because basically it can offer us another access actually to reveal new physics, exciting physics. And one question more. Have your uh, fermionic excitations electric charge or no? Sure, it's electrical, yeah. So, so you, 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 you can investigate the uh, interaction with these uh, photons with electromagnetic field yes. using the minimality principle. Yes. Is, is it in correlation with the minimality principle? Absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. But what about power lithium, sigma minu, f minu? <laughs> um, what sigma minu? Sigma mu, this is generator of Lorentz symmetry in your case, non relativistic there is rotation. A symmetry here. Yes, I see, but it's a rotation generator for, for O3 group associated with sigma matrices. How will you use? This is two dimensional, so there is no three, three. Okay, it's, it, it should be ga gamma, ga gamma three <laughs> generator of rotation. I'm embarrassed, actually. I, I think I should know the answer to this question, but I don't. So. Okay. You can educate me at the blackboard. <laughs> Maybe we can put that up on. John, another question. John. Yeah, I seem to remember many years ago hearing about some what were called gapless semiconductors that were... Yeah, that's Edmund's point. ...that uh, were three-dimensional uh, sort of massless Dirac mm -hmm. spectra. Mm -hmm. uh, has, yeah, have these been examined really? again in the light of the kinds of recent developments you're talking about? Yeah, so there is a sort of like uh, the theorem about how many, uh, how, how robust are the, the, the direct crossing points are in the, in, the, in the number of dimensions. And it has to do with this, I think it's a cone theorem or somebody basically, uh, I don't know the theory, but basically I think my understanding is that it's much harder to realize in 3D. Now, case of helium-3 A phase is example. And by the way, that's why I'd like to talk about the Dirac materials and not necessarily electronics. Because in the helium-3 case, you have a Dirac points and you have excitations. Not all excitations, but they're neutral. And so basically, it doesn't have, have to be the, 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 the charged charge particle that, that, that do this thing. Basically, so more like a thermionic combination of this excitation. So, but for the 3D, I think uh, most of the, essentially only, the only uh, results I know are this uh, work by Eduardo Fratkin and Gordon Seminoff about the uh, nodal excitations. So I don't, I don't think anybody realized them experimentally, but maybe I'm wrong. Okay, Abdullah has another question. The, the last question. <laughs> no, I was told I have to confine it in 45 minutes. So I can show you the, so look, the story, okay. You ask for it. <laughs> I'll show you the, there's very interesting things about the superconductivity in graphene. So to begin with, it's realized experimentally. I don't know if you know it, but because this material, the graphene sheet is so robust, you can put in place, place a lead on it. All right, so let's do it one step at a time. So here it is, superconducting graphene. Uh, so what happens if you place superconducting leads, and I forgot the material, say tin or niobium, you put it on the normal graphene sheet and you inject in Cooper pairs and such. All right? Uh, what happened then is that uh, you can have the Johnson current between and 
the side of the device, this is work done by Mark Forger, again, very recently. Uh, the sizes are huge, it's actually a fraction of a micron. And the, 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 the interesting part of this paper was, at least the paper, uh, the, the emphasis was placed on the ability to produce this kind of like bipolar Josephson effect. You can predominantly put the electrons, the Josephson current through electrons or through the holes by doing the back gate. Okay? Now, uh, we looked at the, because I was talking about impurities, we looked at the effect of the impurities for this V-shaped density of states, and you can put in by hand the superconducting water parameter there. And the reason you put it in by hand because it's a proximity-induced superconductivity. So any interaction will open up the gap. An interesting aspect of it was that uh, there is no, <coughs> there is no coherence factors. All the excess spectral weight you squeeze out uh, moves to the edges. So there is no coherence peak, basically the density of state just opens up. And inside this density of state there will be impurity resonance. So this was our kind of, uh, the, the suggestion also was to look at the, uh, to look at the impurity states in the superconducting here. For people who are technically inclined, uh, it's actually two sublattices. Or if you want to, it's so like points in the brilliant zone, K and K prime. Now, if I want to do the pairing, I have to engage K and K prime points at the same time. So I have two, so like, uh, values, two sub lattices, two components of particles. So it's, a, it's a sort of like sparse, but it's an 8 by 8 matrix that adequately describes superconductivity in the right, So it's actually a very interesting mathematical uh, so like exercise, or if you want physics exercise, or how, for instance, PCS superconductivity will work out. Carlo Benneker spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, talking about this, and so there are some papers published already about But I... So the pairing is to compensate No, no. The pairing is actually, there is no pairing. There is a proximity induced superconductivity. You're injecting pairs for free. Uh, so the story is again. Can inject the pair. This is normally say say left. The superconducting lead. And then actually the normal film here is graphene field. We supply and cooper pairs for free, and then basically they were showing the nice ground pattern and many other things. So again, this is actually very interesting. So I get to play. I was telling you that this is another scale and homogeneous, but maybe on the scale, so it grew larger than this nanoscale scale and homogeneity, material recovered this behavior recovers simple kind of direct description. 